much people said. Amen. Come on. I love someone said, hey, preacher, do you want to keep your part short so we can get back to the music? I'm like, thank you. I really appreciate that. You know, I, <laughs> I always appreciate your honesty. I do. Like, even when you open with, gosh, you're so much shorter in person than I imagine. <laughs> uh, I, had a, I had a great conversation with someone this week. And you know it's always going to be good when someone says, hey, can, can I be honest with you for just a moment? That's when you're like, as a pastor, you're like, oh, here we go. It's on. And this guy, one of my favorite conversations, he said, I'm, I'm, not, gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you. A couple weeks ago, I mean, you, you talked about the series that we were gonna be doing, long story short. The Bible in six simple movements, like connecting the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he said, you're talking about this. And, and I leaned over to my wife, and this is what I said. This is gonna be so boring. And he drew that out, and I'm like, wow, I hope this conversation gets better. But he just like, he, he came alive. He said, I have to tell you, this is so good. And what I love was he just started kind of like preaching to me, Genesis 1, the overture. Genesis 2, God's greater story on humanity. Genesis 3, the, the desire that we have to look at everything that's wrong with the world, but to focus on everything that God has done and is doing that is right. He said, Pastor, it's coming alive to me. And I don't think there can be a better compliment. That's the hope of this series, by the way. That's the hope is we're starting this brand new year to, to look at this book, this book that is a collection of these ancient manuscripts, but to be able to piece these things together. Six weeks from creation to the fall. Today I'm gonna talk about Israel. What does, what does that mean? God had a rescue plan in place in the other side of the fall, and he called a people, and he gave them a name. And how does the story of Israel match our story? That's what I'm gonna talk about today. But then next week, we move into the New Testament. Next week, we talk about Jesus. The week after, we, um, we'll talk about the church, and then we wrap it, spoiler alert, if you haven't finished the Bible, God makes all things new. God takes the garden in the beginning in Genesis 1 and 2, and somehow through all of the chaos, through a savior, God restores this place to where it was intended to be. So it's an important series. I thank you. I love it. I, I challenged you a couple weeks ago. I really want you to have perfect attendance for this. And I know seats were kind of crammed in here, and I feel a little guilty. I, like some of you should just come and sit up here with me on the stage. There's way too much space up here. Maybe we should put some of those luxury loungers, you know, in the cinema. How about that, by the way? Nothing is better than watching this intense scene in a movie and you just hear, <laughs> you know those seats? It's like, it's really ruined my experience for me. <laughs> anyway, I digress. So let me, uh, let me open us in a word of prayer and let's dive in. Holy Spirit, please come back if I chased you away. <laughs> let's just pray. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that... Oh, we've said these words, our hearts are saying these, we've saying these words today. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It is well, it is well with my soul that you are a mighty, mighty God. A lot of gods vie for our attention in this world. A lot of things cry out our name, but Father, you're mighty. You bring peace to the broken. You take our broken pieces and you make them whole. So today we come on a day that we give back, Commitment Sunday, but greater, before we ever make a commitment, we lift our eyes to the one who is worthy. We are reminded that even in the even in the midst of the wrestle, the struggle that we have in our lives, that God, you're doing a good work. So my prayer today is that you would just use this, that you would speak through me, if not through me, in spite of me. Thank you for the gifts that you've given so many brothers and sisters. God, thank you for this gift this morning of Highland Park, this worship team, just for their willingness and hearts just to reflect you and just to lead us in a place of celebration. So now, Holy Spirit, sweep across this space. Brush up against us, holy God. Thank you that our story, as long as we're taken in breath, it's never done. Speak through me, if not through me, in spite of me, so that your will and your words can be heard, and it's in your name that we say amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, let's start here. Go to Genesis chapter 12. You know, I like to think, I like to think that 
I did a, a pretty good job of raising teenagers, with the exception of every time they reminded me I was doing a terrible job at raising them of, of, as teenagers. They're not teens anymore. Thank you, Lord. Prayer works, parents. Um, they're 23 and 20. She's about, my daughter's about to be 21. But, you know, I just, we had this struggle. I feel like we, we were fortunate in one sense as far as social media goes because they really kind of missed, I think, Facebook. My kids, when they were in high school, Facebook was starting to be a thing. But, you know, our generation, we hijacked it and we took it away from the younger generation. So that's, they're not on that. So social media wasn't really a thing for my kids. But the one thing that was were those cell phones. The one thing that was, especially with my son, was this wrestling because, quote, unquote, all of his friends had iPhones, and he didn't. He had that Motorola brick slide phone. How many of you remember that? Which was good for three things. Number one, making calls. Number two, receiving calls. And number three, playing snake. Do you remember that? A teenager needs nothing else in school. So he's like, Dad, all my friends, they all have iPhones. And I'm like, Nick, you have two friends. That's not a majority of all your friends in high school. <laughs> He's like, it's just so, come on. I'm like, no, there was a moment, <laughs> there was a moment, however, that the hardness of my heart began to be chiseled away. I'll never forget this. I know my wife remembers this. He came home from school. He's like, how was school? This was terrible. He's like, why was it terrible? Well, apparently his teacher was giving an exam, a final exam, and the teacher said to the class, hey, I want all of you guys to bring your phones and I want you to set them up here on the counter because I don't want you tempted to cheat, to use your phones to cheat. So everybody put your phones here. So Nick said his entire class, 25 students, got up. They all went and they put their phones on the counter and then they all go and they sit down. And then Nick said the teacher went over to get the exams and stopped, went over, took Nicholas's brick Motorola phone and said, hey, whose is this? And Nicholas said, that's mine. And the teacher goes, yeah, you can keep this. That's fine. You don't. <laughs> In fact, Sorensen, you can play snake if you're done early. <laughs> it's terrible. He's like, come on. You know what's amazing? Here, here's the transition. What's amazing to me is when you move past the fall, when you move past the Garden of Eden and all of a sudden we're out and the parameters, the circumstances have certainly changed. God's still a part of his people. But you move into the story of the first dysfunctional family, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. If you, any time you feel like your family's just messed up, read Genesis, you're gonna feel better every time. Cain and Abel and murder comes onto the scene and then you move into the, the flood and, and God starting with, Ad, or with Noah and Noah's family, but just on the other side of that, like these seeds of just brokenness continue to germinate and then you have Babel and there's all these stories early in Genesis and you just think, is this the moment that God is just gonna wrap it up and, and throw it in a wastebasket and say, well, I gave it a good try. I just don't think this is gonna work. No. In Genesis 12, you find that God has a rescue plan, a rescue operation in place. And where you would think that God would go to the newest model, to the shiniest warrior, to the one who's going to William Wallace God's people into a clarion fight to bring about the transformation of the world, God uses a 75-year-old Motorola brick phone by the name of Abram. Abram. You may know him as Abraham. And here's Abram. He's, he's had, we don't know much about him before Genesis chapter 12. The end of Genesis 11 gives you a little context. Later in scripture, you find that Abram's family, his parents, they weren't believers. He's 75 years old. He's in love. He's married to his wife named Sarai, but you know that she's barren. She's unable to have children. And it's in the middle of this moment in Abram's life where he has settled that all of a sudden, God begins to speak into this operation rescue plan that he has in place. Look at what he says. God says, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And here's God's promise, his covenantal promise to his people. Now, there is a contract. If we have a contract together, if you break it, I can tear the contract up. That's a contract. A covenant is binding. 
a covenant. This is something that God is making to his people. And he's saying, look, even when and if it gets ugly, and it will, my nature, you being my people, that's not gonna change. So look at what he says. He says, I'll make you into a great, what's that word? Nation. I'll make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and this. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God makes a promise. God doesn't give Abram the play-by-play. God doesn't give Abram the GPS coordinates. God doesn't give Abram the book on this is how it's all gonna play out, but God gives Abram a mighty promise, and this is the promise. Hey, Abram, guess what? All the people on this planet will be blessed through you, but here's what I need from you, Abram. This right here, are you ready? a step. I need you to trust. I need some obedience from you. And the amazing thing is this is where God's rescue operation begins. It begins with the obedience of Abram. And it says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. So what do we know about Father Abraham? who had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And look, I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, amen? Those of you that aren't laughing, go back to Sunday school in the children's wing. They'll teach that to you. Had many sons. We grew up with that song. We know that song. Well, I can tell you too, Ishmael, Abraham would have Ishmael, and Abraham would also have Isaac. Now, when you move into that generation in the Genesis story, you find that Isaac has these two sons, Jacob and Esau, and from the very beginning, there is some serious sibling rivalry that you found. So now flip over to Genesis chapter 32, and let me tell you, Genesis 12, God promises Abram a nation that's going to be blessed through him. In Genesis 32, within the context of this story, we find the nation has a name, and the name has a meaning, and it comes through Jacob. Now, Jacob was the second of a twin. I've talked about this before. Esau, he, um, he was hairy. That was his name. Jacob was heel grabber. Jacob literally came out of the womb in second place holding on to his brother's heel. And what you find is Jacob grows up looking at his circumstances, looking at his brother who is more handsome, who is more skilled, who has the eyes of his father. And rather than, Jacob, rather than find his identity by seeing himself in the reflection of his creator, Yahweh, he begins to look to the world to fill this hole, this purpose, why am I here? He began to just try and find the things of the world that would fill that. So he steals a blessing. So he steals a birthright. And what you find time and time again, that's why I'm saying these Old Testament stories, they are not that far away from our stories, are they? Because some of you, some of us in this place today, we know what it's like. I talked about fig leaves last week, how fig leaves, they're flimsy, they don't hold. God had to cover them. And and we tend to find things that we think are gonna give us purpose and value, but it never does. And praise God that there is always a moment, and sometimes it's hard, most of the time, when you are at your lowest, that's when God is at his highest in your life. And there's a moment in Genesis 32 where Jacob is alone. Scripture says he's left alone, and he encounters, you know the story, he encounters this man, and what he's doing ultimately is he begins to just wrestle with God. He begins to swing away at God. I call this Jacob's Lieutenant Dan moment. Do you remember that moment in Forrest Gump? Forrest, Forrest Gump. Or Lieutenant Dan, he's on the ship, and Lieutenant Dan's mad. He was supposed to die in the battlefield, and Forrest, Forrest Gump, saved him. <laughs> Lieutenant Dan's like, this is not my purpose. I'm not supposed to be here. I have nothing else. And you see in this story, it's so uncomfortable. He tries to find identity in women in all of these different places. And there's the storm in the shrimp boat. And Lieutenant Dan's like, oh. And Forrest is like, oh. And, you know, and I'm watching, 
And I'm hearing these words Lieutenant Dan saying, I'm like, mm, but what happens on the other side of it? Magic legs. He found peace. He found peace. And here's his Lieutenant Dan moment. This is what the story says. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And the man said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man said, what is your name? So many years, Jacob had tried to be everyone else. For so many years, he tried to be Esau. For so many years, he tried to say, no, this is who I am. But this is the first moment that he says his name. My name is Jacob. And here it is, verse 28. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but, what's the word? There we are. Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because, here's why, you have struggled with God, and you've struggled with man, and you have overcome. Now, we go just a little bit further, because this is important too. Verse 30. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it's because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. That word yet means Jacob totally thought God was gonna kill him in this moment. He was like, I'm gonna fight so hard. If this is the way I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna go down letting God know exactly how, I, how mad I am about everything that's going on, but yet God didn't give him death. God gave him a new name, and God gave him life. And on the other side of it, it says, the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. And see, here's the, here's, the, here's the other side of the story. I mean, really, the truth be told, I can jump from Genesis 32 now and just finish out the rest of the Old Testament by saying this. The story of the Old Testament, the story of the Israelites is really a story of a people who just wrestled with God. They just wrestled, and we're no different. I love the way that Joshua McNall, let me read this to you. It was in his chapter, and if you're reading along in the book, then it really takes you a little bit deeper, but I love, I have to share this. He said, from this day forward, the children of Jacob possess a singular calling. They possess a role in God's story, unlike any other people. From this day forward, they are Israel. They're wrestlers. They're to be the family that wrestles with the creator's unique calling upon their lives to be a light to the nations. They've been chosen to be the bringers of God's rescue. The God of the universe has selected them from all the people on the planet to be a part of an operation to restore creation. Did you ever think of it that way? And this was the calling with which every son and every daughter of Israel would have to struggle. Now, read along with this. It was the realization to be passed from every Hebrew mother to her child. God chose us. He spoke to us. And he expects something from us. Like Jacob by the brook, the children of Israel would wrestle with God's call upon their lives to be a different kind of family, a different kind of community, and a different kind of nation. A holy people. I love this. Some would wrestle well, and some would wrestle poorly, but none would escape the struggle. And you know, when I read from, from here, of course, God's people, they move into slavery in Egypt, and God sends them a deliverer and frees them from bondage, and if you read the Exodus story, and you just read, God says, hey, don't ever forget that moment of oppression. Don't ever forget that moment of change, and greater, don't ever forget that moment of what freedom feels like, because you're going to be tempted in your struggle, you're going to be tempted in your life to return to small, to return to change, to return to bondage, but I I have come so that you might know what freedom really is. And I give the Israelites a hard time all the time. I look at the Israelites and I say, tisk, tisk. Shouldn't they have known better? Shouldn't they have known that God is their provider? But then I look at my own life. I look at those times that I actually go back to change, that I go back to anxiety and worry and just worshiping little gods when the God of the universe has called me to freedom, has called us to freedom. So just like 
in Genesis 3, everything that's wrong in the story is everything that's right. When it comes to Jacob and just wrestling, we see that we're wrestlers as well. Some in this room today, I met with someone in my office this week. They were having their Lieutenant Dan moment. They were having their Jacob moment. There's a hole there. They know that God wants to fill it, and they're like, I just need to surrender. But surrender is the hardest thing, but I would say it's the most necessary thing for any follower. Because it's when we're weak that really God is strong. See, for Jacob, he spent his life resisting and fighting God's will. But the lesson he gets here is he learned the secret that true victory can be found when we fully surrender. True victory in your life. True victory is found when you just surrender and you say, have thine own way. A.W. Tozer, I have a collection of his quotes, and one of the quote cards that was looking at me this week, A.W. Tozer, was, was this one. The Lord can't fully bless a man until he has first conquered him. Think about that for a moment. Like God can't fully take you where he wants you to be until you reach that moment in your life where you open up your hands and you say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You prayed that this morning. I don't know if you know that you did. Sometimes I do that and I say, thy will be done on earth. And I feel like God's going, hey, serious about that right now? Because you've been wrestling with a couple things. I mean, I, I love throughout the prophets, when you go further in the Old Testament, again, God's people caught in the struggle, worshiping kings, they find corruption, and the prophets emerge onto the scene, and they're just a voice, a clarion call saying, return back to the one who has this covenant with you. And in Jeremiah, I mean, God says to the people through Jeremiah, we know this, we love this, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a, and a future. I mean, we want prosper, we want hope, we want a future, but the reality is we want it in our own terms and in our own ways. God says, no, I want to give you all these things, but the rest of it, boy, we need to learn 12 too. Then you will call on me, and you'll come, and you'll pray to me, and I'll listen to you. You'll seek me, and you'll find me. When you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. This moment of freedom in Jacob's life was a moment where he just said, okay, here's who I am. And God says, you are Israel. You are a wrestler. You are a struggler. But I am with you every step of the way as long as you surrender, as long as you just place everything in my lap and you trust that I'm going to guide you through it now. The truth is, on the other side of surrender, victory comes when we surrender, and on the other side of surrender, here's the beautiful turn of the story, there's incredible power. Now, Jacob was left with the gift on the other side of wrestling, and you know what that gift was? It was a limp. He was left with a limp, and that limp forever as he's walking would turn into a pretty remarkable story. It would turn into a story where God would take a limp in his life and use that to proclaim a greater truth, a victory that's made available when we surrender our lives to God. Some of you have limps in your your story. You do, some of you do. We all do to an extent. Some of you have some kind of brokenness. Remember, the serpent in the garden is no different in Genesis 3 than the serpent is in our garden today, and he wants you to be defined by the limp. He wants you to be defined by the struggle. He wants you to be defined by how bad, by how broken, by how much shame you have. But God says, you take that limp and you give it to me and you let me bring some glory into your story. I have a sheet of paper. It falls out of my Bible on occasion. And any time the sheet of paper falls out, I think there's a reason. Because God wants me to be reminded of what's on this sheet of paper. I've shared it a while back. But it's a story of people with limps. It's a story of these old Motorola brick phones that God tends to take in the Old Testament found in people and do incredible things. If you think God can't use you, this is what this says, and I think it fits so well. Think about this. Noah was a drunk. 
Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses stuttered. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was too young. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Don't look that one up. <laughs> Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ three times. The disciples fell asleep while they were praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman divorced multiple times. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer. And Lazarus was dead. <laughs> These are people <laughs> with some serious limps in their life, but yet they tapped into the greater truth that even in the struggle, even in the wrestling, that's where we meet the face of God. And that's where we find our power. This is Paul in 2 Corinthians. Paul, who had an affliction of the flesh. Paul, who said, I prayed multiple times for God to take this from me. But God poured into Paul's life and said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power will be made perfect in your, someone say it, weakness. Guess what? When you're weak, but you surrender, God is strong in your life. So let me ask you this question, brothers and sisters, where, where are you struggling? Where are you wrestling in your life? Have you surrendered? Have you just opened up your hands? Have you just said, God, it's a mess right now, but I wanna fully surrender to you, and I trust that you can take this weakness. I trust that you can take this brokenness. I trust that you can take these words that I've said. Someone, maybe you've hurt someone. Maybe you've said something to someone. I sense that's here in this space today. And you feel like the damage just can't be reversed. You feel like God can't heal that, restore that. I just want you to know God hears you. You come to me and you pray to me. Jeremiah 29, 11, the Lord says, I'll hear you when you speak to me with your heart. And I will bring you back from captivity. Some of you, you're on your knees and you're like, God, this is where I need restoration in my life. But then you just, you take it back. You take the wounds back. Release the limp. Fully surrender. Seek out some counsel, some guidance. We're here. We have a few pastors on staff. I don't know if you know that. And we love to just hear your story. We love to encourage you. Let me just, can we move into a time of prayer? Let me just pray for you right now. God, I just come before you on this Sunday, just sensing when we talk about a people who wrestled with you. Lord, when we see all of the wrestling that happens in Scripture, we're reminded that God, faith and obedience and stepping when we don't have the plan, it's hard and it's scary. But yet the reminder time and time and time again is your covenant is strong. Your words are true. So Lord, I pray over hearts in this space today that God, they'd have some hope that they would just sense the same God of Abraham and Jacob it's the same God over our story and our lives today, and you still bring victory. You still bring hope and a future, and it comes through surrender. So may we fully surrender. And it's in the name of Jesus, the sweet name of Jesus, the one who has given us the authority to pray in his name. It's in the name of Jesus that we say, amen.